Live from bustling Jamaica, Queens in New York City, this is JASDA TV, a ministry of the Jamaica Seventh day Adventist Church located at 8828 163rd Street in Jamaica, New York, where nurture, education, and salvation is our primary business. Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I learned to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee.
for the next few years. There's only one request I have. And that is take care of my wife. Amen. Remember her anniversary and her birthdays. Let her know that you appreciate her because her husband works hard for you. And the harder I work for you, the less she has of me. So would you make that promise to me? That's all I asked. Matthew, the 21st chapter. I'm sorry, Matthew, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Zidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. The cry, I should say, a mother's plea. A mother's plea, Father, we seek you because we need you. We can do nothing without you. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight and we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. A mother's plea. Black women have a century born the heat of the day. Prized as precious commodity ever since the beginning of time she has been living with the attraction that all races of men have had for her. In the early years of the great Kushite Empire the black woman was desired by Indo-European races because she was the means by which they had access to African royalty. Because the Africans, it was reported, who were the earliest empire builders, they had a matriarchal system where the firstborn child of the sister of the king would inherit the throne and become king. Thus in Egypt, Moses was designated to be Pharaoh. The black woman had been sought by many. Moses, who married Zipporah, David, who married Bathsheba, Samson, who desired Delilah, but probably the most powerful one, and one you might not even have thought about, was Solomon, who married the Shulamite woman, who is described in the songs of Solomon as the most beautiful woman ever. In fact, it'll probably be worth your time for us to read Songs of Solomon, chapter, five, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The Shulamite, the bride of, of Solomon, speaks. She says, I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Then, in verse 6, she pleads, Look not upon me, because I am black because the sun had looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. So that is how she saw herself. You know, she, she was used to being abused because she was darker than all the other women in the harem. But look how Solomon thinks of her in that Songs of Solomon chapter 6, beginning at uh, verse 4. Solomon says, Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tisra, comely as Jerusalem, 
terrible as an army with banners. They are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. Yet, he says, verse 9, my dove, my undefiled is but one. She's the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that beareth her. The daughters saw her and blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines, they praise her. So as far as Solomon was concerned, she may have been the blackest of the bunch, but she was the most beautiful. So other cultures were constantly seeking the African queen as mate, and her own men knew her strength and integrity and could not do without her. Like a prized jewel, the black woman was constantly in demand. Whenever her armies came, the soldiers would climb head over heels to find some lovely black maiden that they could exploit to fulfill their fantasy, if not by choice, then by force. But even God, even God was always on the lookout for what Solomon described as a virtuous woman. You see, ever since the fall of Eve, a brown-skinned woman created from the red clay of Eden, God was constantly checking, surveying, looking for the right woman because the Bible says when the fullness of time would have come, God had every intention to send forth his firstborn son who tabernacle within the womb of a woman who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There is a little doubt, of course, that Solomon, when he was writing... Um, about the virtuous woman of Proverbs 34 was talking about his chief bride, the Shulamite, a black woman. It is a story of an African sister that Proverbs chapter 31, when Solomon asked in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Notice verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that she will have, so that he will have no need for spoil. In other words, this woman is a woman who knows how to care for a man. He continues, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. In other words, she knows how to encourage and to support him so that his value and his self-esteem is increased. Verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh diligently with her hands. In other words, she's a hard worker. Verse 14, she is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. In other words, she's a great, she, has, she has great business acumen. Verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She's in charge of her house. Uh, verse 16, she conceiveth, considered a field and bide it with the fruit of her own hand, she planted a vineyard. In other words, she knows how to invest wisely for the future. Verse 17, she girded her loins with strength and strengthened her arms. In other words, she takes time to exercise on a regular basis. Verse 18, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. In other words, she is always ready to do what is needed to be done. Verse 20, she stretched out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reached forth her hands to the needy. In other words, she is generous and compassionate. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She is prepared for the unexpected. Verse 32, she maketh herself covering of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. In other words, she knows how to take care of herself. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. In other words, all the other men are sitting down talking about her. Verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. In other words, business people want to do business with her. Strength and honor, verse 25 says, are her covering and she shall rejoice in the time to come. In other words, she's got a wonderful future. Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. In other words, according to Solomon, she is smart, yet she is humble. Verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. In other words, her family can depend on her. Verse 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. In other words, her husband and her children know that they can't do without her. 
Verse 29, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. In other words, to Solomon, nobody compares to her. And then verse 30, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that fear of the Lord, she shall be praised. In other words, this woman, and I say it again, Solomon is talking about his chief woman, who happens to be an African sister called a Shulamite, uh, but she's a woman of faith, and she loves and serves the Lord. Now, that woman is a superwoman. But amazing as it seems, many of us, as we look at the mothers in our midst and in our lives, somehow, these words aptly describe her. Jesus, Jesus was about to meet such a woman. Jesus was murking among the Jews for about a year and a half now. And ever since he started his ministry, they've been trying to kill him. Right now, he's tired, or he's, he's tired, he's fed up, he had enough of these Jewish leaders because they spent all their time trying to trap him. Now, he committed his life to their salvation, traveled from earth, from heaven to earth for their redemption, gave up riches for poverty, exchanged a palace for a manger. He would give his life for their death. Yet, they scrutinize his every word, criticize his every move, and were constantly seeking to fabricate reasons so that they could throw him in jail. So the Bible says Jesus grew tired of their foolishness and with righteous indignation in Matthew chapter 15 beginning at verse 7 Jesus says you hypocrites well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips but their hearts is far from me. And then he continues Matthew 15 9 in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men blind folks leading blind folks and then the Bible says in haste he leaves the coast of Israel and enter, entered into the Hamitic nation of Zidon and Tyre just where you could experience a mother's plea only one time on record that I know that Jesus left his own country as Jesus as Jesus enters this coastal area of Tyre and Zidon after having left the nation of Israel he encountered an unusual experience the Bible says he encounters what 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 Matthew chooses to call a Syrophoenician woman Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21 then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Zidon. Verse 22, And behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now these Phoenician people are known in your Bible as Canaanites. In history, they are called Phoenicians, called by the Greek Phoenicians after the purple dye that they harvested and marketed all over the world. These Phoenicians were similar to the Jews in language and culture, and many believe that the 10 tribes had been absorbed into them, because if you remember, these tribes had been dispersed. The Phoenicians were tremendously wealthy and powerful people. They were well aware of all the happenings in the world. They were world travelers with trading partners of all the great nations of the sea. And in their role as entrepreneurs, they discovered lands and continents that other civilization had not yet discovered. Obviously, they knew something about Jesus. As you read their story in the book of Matthew, Mark and Luke, you realize that, that, that when the Phoenicians meet Jesus, they knew about his ability to cast out demons and to bring dead men back to life. 
They had heard about his power to lift up the crippled and to encourage the discouraged. They, they knew that he had a reputation to elevate the disenfranchised and to make the lost and the homeless feel as if they lo- belonged somewhere. They knew about Jesus. And so some other words spread over Phoenicia that Jesus had come into their coast. Uh, quickly they hastened to where he was and, and as you read that chapter, what you'll discover is that teeming Thousands of Phoenicians, meaning, meaning, teeming, teeming thousands of black folks, came down and brought their sick, their lame, their blind, their weak, and cast them before Jesus. In fact, it's there that Jesus, the Bible says that he heals them, and he also feeds the 4,000 men. Some of you thought those were Jews. I'm not preaching about that today, but those were fed in Phoenicia. And while there, Jesus is there in this strange country, he heard a cry ringing above the crowd, Jesus, Jesus, this woman said, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Jesus, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. Jesus, she says, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. The Bible says in verse 23, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples, disciples, uh, sizing up the situation said, now look here, Jesus, don't mess with this woman. She's going to mess up your ministry. You just left the Jewish people because you are not happy with their service. To to associate with her now is to get defiled. She's a Gentile. Don't, 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 Don't mess with her. Now Jesus knew this woman's situation. And believe it or not, the disciples didn't know it, but according to the Desire of Ages prayer for uh, page 400, Jesus came here because of her. Glory, hallelujah. You thought Jesus didn't know your situation or what was going on in your life? Uh, she says, my, my favorite author says, he placed himself in her path. You see, Jesus knew how the disciples would have related to somebody like this, and he was about to act like them just so they could see just how mean and ugly they were. They had built up a wall of petition among them and these people who lived over there in Tyre and Zidon. And Jesus was about to tell them those walls, those roads, walls of petition must be tumbling down. Uh, He had just left his own people, called them blind folks because they wouldn't believe on him. And now he meets a woman whom the disciples think is going to mess up his ministry. The disciples are thinking, if he talks and touch this woman, that's it. Word is going to get back to Jerusalem and our ministry is over. We will never achieve what we want to achieve. The world leaders we're planning. We're planning to be his prime ministers and his treasurers. Don't, don't. Jesus, they said, leave that woman alone. Now, mind you, she had never met Jesus before, but she knew him. <laughs> because notice she calls him by his name. <laughs> Not only does she know him by his name, but she knows his title and authority because she calls him the son of David. She calls him the son of the living God. In my mind's eye, what I see is a woman who had, uh, through life, had been having a little talk with God. (laughs) When her cupboard was empty, she had been talking with God. When her sons acted up, she had been talking with God. When things weren't going right, she had been talking with God. She had never met him in person, but she knew him and so now she calls on him says to Nicholas Jesus thou son of the living God have mercy on me Jesus Jesus was caught in a ticklish situation Uh, what is he going to do now a Jewish rabbi according to their culture would not associate with this colored woman the Bible says he answered her not a word And the disciples, when stuff flashed through their eyes and realized this could be the end of his ministry and his life, that their bread and butter would be gone, they said, Jesus, send her away. 
This is not a situation <laughs> that you want to get into. And while Jesus is standing there saying nothing, the Bible says she runs and she throws herself at his feet and worshipped him. Verse 25, Matthew 15, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. <laughs> uh, that, word, that word worship means to bow reverently before a superior. She bows before Jesus and worships him because she knows he is God. <laughs> I'm sure the word had gone back that when Jesus had uh, started his ministry, he had declared from Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to deliver, uh, to bring deliverance to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Lord, that's me. She is falling down before him. Lord, she says, help me. This woman, like Jacob of old, was simply saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. <laughs> And then Jesus says this, verse 26, But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? <laughs> oh, the tremendous insults that black mothers have faced through the ages. Raped, scorned, Abandoned, abused, even by their own men who claim they love them. In America today, she struggles, sometimes alone, to care for her family. And in some instance, even when she has a man in the house, he shows little appreciation for her commitment and dedication. She's forced to work outside the home and inside the home. Many times, she is both mother and father. To be black sometimes can be a tremendous burden. God says to whom much is given, much is expected. We black folks have come an awfully long way. You see, the early Egyptians claimed that their forefathers came from the presence of God. The early Greeks called the sons of Africa, called Africa the land of the gods, and the Africans the mighty warriors of the god. Yet, Europeans would later call us subhumans monkeys, one-eyed monsters, heathen, Gentiles, and now even dog. Seems that ever since the 18th century, uh, the other races have had nothing but indignation for the people burnt by the rays of the sun. And now looking into the eyes of this African sister, Jesus says, can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs not meat to take the children's bread and give it to the dog. Now, had that been an African man, he would have clenched his fist and knocked Jesus out right on the spot. An African man would have forgotten his stately bearing, would have caught Jesus by the neck if he could. How dare a Jew call me a dog? But not this woman. Because she has that title called mother. And Jesus can call her anything he wants to call her. There's only one thing on her mind. And that is at home is a girl who is dying. And Jesus is her only hope. There is no indignity she will not endure for her maternal offspring. She had learned through the years to endure pain others thought was unbearable. She's gone through stuff people thought would kill her, but she's still alive. She is as strong as the oak, yet she's flexible enough to bend and not break under the pressure. She's as gentle as a breeze, yet she's strong enough to move mountains, to tear down buildings, and to whip the sea into fury. She is mother, and there is nothing you can say Jesus to turn her away today Amen. for her little girl is suffering and so she responds true Jesus but even the dog can eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table in other words what I am asking of you is nothing but a crumb 
Now I know some people might think of it as extraordinary if you speak the word right here and my daughter gets healed over there. But I know who you are. I know that you're the God of the universe. It was you who knelt by the side of the Nile River and formed us in the first place. You created the mountains with your, with your voice and filled the sky with all the birds. This is nothing for you. I'm not asking much, just a crumb. She blew Jesus' mind. Jesus said, I've never seen such faith. Woman, it's done what you have asked. I'll praise God back home. A little girl who was sick suddenly came back to heal. Jesus, by the way, in calling this woman a dog, was simply acting like the disciples would have acted. He is just trying to help them to see just how mean and ugly they are. You know, it's amazing how mean we can get in the name of Jesus. It, it seems like a contradiction, you know. The Bible talks about what love is and, and that God is love. And you think that his people would be love also. But, but some of us in the church, oh God forbid, we, 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 we got the words of religion in our mouth. But, but, but somehow we're mean and ugly and still think we're holy and so these men these 12 men thought themselves to be holy they were walking for, with Jesus for 3 plus years but they were mean and they thought of those people whom God had died to save as dogs and so Jesus acted just like them just so he could make an impression on their minds so that they could say do you, you mean that's how we treat people I know that some of you as mothers are going through some rough times. You got sons and daughters who have gone astray. You got husbands and you're in relationships that aren't so good. You wake up sometimes and cry yourself at night. As one sister told me yesterday, she said, she didn't say cry, she said, Pastor, I was bawling. <laughs> you, you read my mind. She said, I bawled, cry, that, that's too, I was bawling. Sometimes life gets like that, but I came by to tell you that Jesus will hear a mother's plea. Jesus will hear a mother's cry. So maybe, maybe you feel all alone sometimes. Uh, maybe you can't see him like she did. She, she had the opportunity to see him, but whether or not you can see him, I came by to tell you he is there that Jesus is on the main line. You can call him up and tell him what you want. And, and every, every burden that wears you down, every experience that tears you up, God is standing right there with you. And he's hurting while you're hurting. And, and he's ready to give you a deliverance. So don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. You know, I'm encouraged when I read, when I read, when I read in Spirit of Prophecy about a mother's prayer. A mother's prayer. You know, I used to, as a child, walk into my mother's room at night and she'd be on her knees praying and as she prayed and poured out her heart before God tears would come down her cheek and I'd hear her call her children's name and she'd call my name and you know that's, that, that, that still walks with me through life even though she's long gone and, and many times when trouble came my way and I wanted to get in trouble I'd see those tears running down her cheek and I'd, and I'd hear her call my name to Jesus and my heart would be broken and I just couldn't do it it, it just kept me her tears and her, her plea kept me I came by to tell you that some of your children are only going to make it because of your prayer sometimes you're tempted to give up because it seems so hopeless. They've gone so far. But I want to tell you, cry. Plead before God. Because as you plead and as you cry before God, your prayer, your cry, your plea is moving God's hand. Maybe it's not moving as fast as you want. But I came by to tell you, it's moving in one of these days. That wayward boy, that wayward child is going to come home all because of a mother's plea. Amen. So I want to challenge and encourage you today, despite what you might be going through, don't take for granted 
the plea of a mother. God Amen. bless you. Amen. You've been watching Dr. Stephen L. Williams, Sr., pastor of the Jamaica Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 88-28, 163rd Street in Jamaica, New York. We invite you to visit the Jamaica Church in New York City every Saturday at 9.15 a.m. for our Sabbath school services and 11 a.m. for our worship services when Dr. Stephen Williams will speak. Or you may join our live stream services at www.jasda.tv or praisevision.com. If you'd like to know more about the Bible, please visit our online Bible school by clicking the Bible school link on our website. Like us on Facebook or send us an email or tweet to let us know how you're being blessed by our ministry. Thank you for watching JASDA.TV, a ministry of the Jamaica Seventh-day Adventist Church.